and uh, they oftentimes what you what you're doing at the school board the water board um, your local city council that ma that is dealing with your everyday life That's like how you said, build it, it. oh yeah people well, people else. come to me about the issues individually with their ch children every day inside the schools and how, how are we going to improve them uh, whereas we also work on policy issues but uh, to go along with your point another thing that I think uh, women have to overcome and us as Republicans and not just Republicans but all women uh, there seems to be with women in general a confidence gap and a preparation gap mm -hmm. where women oftentimes will wait to run because or not run because they think they might lose or they don't know enough or they haven't been trained on this and they don't know everything all, all before mm -hmm. it, it already happens and what we need to do, I think, first of all, is tell women, A, you can run, you can run. W what's the matter? So what, you lose? That's the only thing that's going to happen to you if you run for office and you don't win. Guess what, you lose. <laughs> so what, we can get over it. You can get over it. There, there, that's, a bit, that's a step we can, in the right direction. At least you can say you tried. Um, the other thing is oftentimes women have this preparation gap and what again that goes back to us Making sure we start women early making sure that we get them in the ground get them involved uh, Knocking doors on campaigns involved in our local process uh, election process whether that's with service learning or volunteer hours uh, and getting them involved because once they feel like they can contribute something to their local elections, then they'll know a little bit more about the issue. One last question. Yeah, oh, sure. Go ahead, yeah. Joanna, and then we'll uh, choose. Teresa, I think Laura just means that. Oh, okay. No, no, we were, I was talking but to both oh. of you. Sorry. You'll go next, Patrice. Sorry. Go, go ahead, Joanna. Go ahead. Okay, well, okay. I just want to, I mean, Ashley, you probably touched on it a little bit, but what can we learn from the left? If they are so effective at getting so many more women elected and into the pipeline, are there lessons that we can be applying to our side of the perspective? Well, um, <laughs> having run uh, at, at the level of federal politics, um, it, <laughs> Look, yeah, I'm going to bring a Northeastern bias to this question, obviously, but um, the, and I'm not saying any, God, nothing unique, but I think the Republican Party has been perceived in recent decades as not being the party that welcomes, and Jen, you said it, you know, not being the party that welcomes uh, people who aren't male and white. Now, that's actually antithetical to the founding of our party, which is one reason I cherish it so much. It was founded to oppose slavery, my God. You know, that we are the most liberating party. You know, we can be so proud of our history. Dinesh D'Souza's written eloquently about it. But I do think, I do think, Teresa, I mean, you see, it, 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 you know, it, it, look, women in the Northeast will look at you and say, you know, why are you a Republican kind of thing, right? <laughs> and, and, and I'm more than happy to explain why. I, I absolutely am. Um, but I, I, look, you know, there are, there are parts of the platform that many women cherish, um, but certainly in certain parts of the country, coasts and Northeast and probably in DC Metro, uh, many women say, those are parts that I have a really hard time with. Um, and I just, I, I do think that makes it tough. I, I feel as though I'm saying something incredibly obvious, but th realistically, that's what I hear. And I, because I get a lot of women who say, I am so with you on the fiscal issues. I am so sick of being abused as a taxpayer. I mean, they're with you. And I get men too who say the same thing. I don't want to, but they're, you know, it's like, I used to use the analogy. It's like I walk up to your door, knock on your door. I've got 10 things to offer you, Jen. I'm gonna lower your taxes, fantastic, I love that. I'm gonna make government responsible to you, wonderful, I think that's great, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna reduce the bureaucracy, yeah. Name, you know, the nine different things that you think are fantastic. And then the 10th thing, insert social issue of your choice in the Northeast, okay, social issue. Uh, and that 10th thing is like saying to them, and to do these things I have to burn down your house, you know, or I have to, you know, right, take your dog. And yeah, yeah, I mean, something, you know, it's like, I can't go there with you. I, I love what you're saying on the other nine things, but I can't go with you on this one thing. And as a woman in the Northeast, you know, it's a little tricky. 
the left, well, I think, has, oh. uh, the left has fought really hard in the past uh, decade to be the party of cool. Uh, they've gotten involved with the millennials, gotten on the TV, in the newspaper, in the, uh, in the magazines. Uh, I think we have had a problem uh, in the past years of being, like Jen said, the party of old white men. Yeah. And uh, we need to, frankly, come out and make conservatism cool again. Uh, that's that's gonna that's gonna take a while. It's gonna take a lot of change, but uh, part of it is making sure that you identify as a conservative. In D.C., uh, I knocking doors myself. There were so many people that said it's so refreshing that you uh, are identify as a Republican or as a conservative. You know, I used to be a. A Republican. I changed my party affiliation because Republicans can't win in DC. Or, shh, don't tell anyone. I really am a conservative, but I just vote. I just vote <laughs> Democrat, so uh, so I can vote for mayor, <laughs> like so, or vote two, in the primary. Two things: the vast majority of 18 to 34 year olds in this country are not affiliated with a party. They're not Democrats. They're not Republicans. They don't even. They're not even independents. They're just not affiliated. So in my mind, that's like a huge proving ground for Back Republicans. To and so to. To, to your point, we're, we're not quite getting there with those folks and with that population, which is why part of our group's effort is really about trying to pull them in. I think mm -hmm. secondly, uh, to be blunt, again, we talked about this, like we don't have a home for these women. Like, I mean, I hate to say that, but like, where would you go? If mm -hmm. you're, I, mean, I don't care where you live, but like if you're a Republican woman and you're 35 or 45, whatever your age is, where would you go? Mm -hmm. Are you gonna call up your local party leader and say, hi, I think I wanna run for Congress. I have no political experience whatsoever. Probably not. But if you knew where to begin, you knew where to start, you knew there was a place that could teach you how to be a good at public speaking. I don't know anything about Syria or ISIS, but you know what? Like, what if someone asked me about that in a debate? I would look stupid. I don't want to sound stupid in front of people. Mm -hmm. Is that a requirement to be a congresswoman? Is I have to know about ISIS? Because I don't know anything about ISIS. So, and Democrats I, don't mind if you say something stupid. Right. And so, well, exactly. <laughs> but, but the idea is that we have to build a home. And I don't have to keep coming back to Julie Conway, but like, you have to build a place for people to come, whether that's for money, whether that's for support, whether that's to be a Sherpa was that's to introduce them to the right people here in Washington. But that's a step in the process. And until we, in the past 15 years, we probably have more organizations than ever that are really committed to trying to be that young millennial Republican group, that older Republican group, that women group who like, like certain things. Like, I don't know. But the idea is that we have more groups now. And I think they're all kind of recognizing that if we want more women in Congress, regardless of party affiliation, we got to try a little harder to give women a home. And so right now, if I don't know who to call, if I'm a Republican and I want to run for office and I'm a woman, and if I didn't know Julie Conway, I wouldn't know who to call, period. So the idea is that call Julie Conway. Everyone here who wants to run for office, call Julie. But the fact of the matter is that until we, until, we build, until we have a home as a party, like an Emily's List, you're not going to know where to go. And so I think we're still working on that. We want to be a part of that. And I think there are all these groups that are talking. And my hope is that maybe in the next five to 10 years, those 10,000 women that Running Start is trained that are between the ages of like 13 and 25 will all come to know where to come home to and hopefully they'll come home to the Republican Party. But that's again to, to Ashley's point about we have to give them a reason to come to our, to our home, if you will. Well, let's continue the conversation outside. We'll let people stretch and have a drink. We have a lovely reception. Thank you all. This was such a great conversation. It was really, it was really great. And thanks to everyone who, who stayed for the day. I hope that you enjoy the, the beautiful weather now. or cookie and come back in. Um, 
Thank you for all of you who have stayed with us this whole afternoon. We really appreciate that. It's nice to know that we still have an audience at almost five in the afternoon. <laughs> so we will reward you afterward with, with you know, beverages and um, refreshments and things. Um, so thank you for joining us for Women in Elected Office, the Need, the Challenge, and the Future. I think what's interesting about this conversation is that sort of despite all of the educational and professional and financial advancements that women have made in recent decades, um, they do remain underrepresented in public office. And this is a conversation that, you know, wherever you sort of fall on the, on the issue coming into this conversation is, is an interesting one sort of as we ask ourselves, why is this happening? Um, I took a look at the Center for American, for American Women in Politics at Rutgers University. They collect a lot of this information data, and it's a very helpful resource, um, sort of where we are right now. So just to give you a few figures, women in this, you know, and I know the administration just got started, so there, there's apt to be more, but seven high-level cabinet or cabinet-level positions. We have three seats on the Supreme Court. Roughly 20% of congressional seats are held by women. Um, the large majority of those are, are Democratic. Um, things are a little better in, in some regards at the state level, the, and the balance of power shifts as well, which is interesting. About a quarter of statewide executive seats are held by women, um, and 42 of those are, are held by Republicans, 32 Democrat. Um, state legislatures are similar. About 25% are held by women. Bless you. <laughs> um, so I think that these, are, you know, I, I, I don't like to call them lagging numbers, but they are in some ways not as robust as in other areas of professional life, um, have led many groups now, both on the left and on the right, to sort of suggest that the feminist movement has fallen short. Um, certainly on the left, activists like Gloria Felt, she's the author of a, a book called No Excuses, she argues that sexism is still to blame for much of this discrepancy in the political arena. Um, other groups like She Should Run, they point to the institutional barriers, especially in fundraising, argue that this makes it more difficult for women to break into political networks. Now, I don't think of myself as sort of Pollyannish about the challenges facing women. Um, I think that sort of the, the moment that you realize how difficult it is to run for public office was when I watched Michelle Bachman in, I guess, the 2008 uh, debates, um, and she left the stage for you know, during a commercial break at one of the debates, and everyone said, where was she? All the men were standing there, and she had to have one of her, like, eyelashes you know, fixed up. And I thought, you know, it is. It's challenging. It is not easy to be, but I, truly, I'm not, I'm not making fun. I'm, God knows I would have had my fake eyelashes on, too. <laughs> Millions of people watching you. Um, so, and I think it's sort of important to keep that in mind, that this is, you know, you're putting yourself through a lot, both from um, sort of the criticism Point. And then also this, this factor that if you are a, a, a younger woman who has a family, um, run, working on a campaign, being on a campaign is not easy. <laughs> I remember some of my limited campaign experience, you know, breakfast at, you know, the Kiwanis Club and, you know, or pancake breakfast and dinners at the Kiwanis Club and there's a whole lot of other stuff in between. So um, I think here today, I, there's not much more for, for me to add, so we'll get right to the panelists. Um, we have a great, great table of women here. I'll start with Laura Cox Kaplan, who's a member of IWF's leadership circle. She's an adjunct professor at American University, where she's been teaching a course on just this issue. And she's a, a strong advocate for women running for public office. Nan Hayworth, who's a member of IWF's board of directors. She's a former member of Congress from New York's 19th district. Um, Ashley Carter, I guess I'm jumping all around here, but it's late in the day so we can get a little casual. Um, she's IWF's Director of Coalitions and she is now at large member of the DC State Board of Education. And Je Jen Higgins, who is a lobbyist by day, but <laughs> she is the chairman of Right Now Women PAC, which also works to help get women elected. Um, so let's give you, each of you a couple of minutes to, to share your story or why you're involved with this and then I can um, ask you some questions. Sure. So go ahead, Lisa. Start? Yeah. Okay. Um, first of all, it's a privilege to be here, and thanks to all of you for sticking around all day. It's been a great day and really exciting, so hopefully we'll end on a positive note, and then you get scotch to boot, which is not bad. <laughs> um, so I approach this conversation from the standpoint of being a corporate board member as well as a non-profit uh, board member and a former corporate executive and partner at PricewaterhouseCoopers. And I recognized a long time ago the value that comes with having women at the table, right? However you get them there, 
There's incredible value in having that diversity of thought and opinion and gender that comes with being female. We're not a monolithic voting block, obviously, and so it's incredibly important to have that representation at the table. During my days at PricewaterhouseCoopers, we actually saw the bottom line benefit to having diversified teams, meaning that we would produce a better product and better solutions when we had diversified teams that were working on our clients' biggest problems. So it, would, it really rang home to me. I was running public policy strategy for the US firm and also sitting on our executive management team. And it occurred to me that in my role, I could be doing a lot more to actually help promote women in the Washington public policy space, something that we had really never done before. We had always had women members of Congress, including Nan Hayworth, in our budget and supported them. But what we had not done was sort of consciously thought about who are the up and comers that maybe aren't on our committees of jurisdiction, but who we can align with from a value standpoint, and we can give them extra money. Can we do some things like giving to women earlier in a campaign cycle to help them basically fend off potential primary challenges? We also put money toward helping women uh, who were less tenured in Congress start leadership packs, which is incredibly important, as Nan will attest, to rising up the committee dais and actually having more power, more power that you can use to help other members of Congress, including other women members of Congress. So it really got my attention and I became very, very passionate about these efforts. I spent 12 years at PricewaterhouseCoopers and 10 on our management team. But ultimately, last July, I decided that the need was great enough that I wanted to leave and focus full time on these efforts. So now, I'm the co-chair of a board, a nonprofit board called Running Start. And Running Start works to get young women in high school and college to identify as future elected leaders. So it's a training program essentially, but it's really a program that aims to help them see what's possible. We match them up with members of Congress like Nan as mentors so that they see people who look like them, who are from their political party, but who are female. And it's an incredibly, incredibly powerful thing. Jen, in fact, is on the board of Running Start with me as well, so we spend a lot of time together. Um, there are really four areas that I think are incredibly important that we could think about as individuals. I think there's a role for private sector entities to actually think about how to move the needle, right? Not in a way that supports quotas, but in a way that's just more thoughtful as it relates to supporting women members, similar to what I talked about with regard to our pact, pact giving. Um, two other areas that, are, that kind of dovetail is around awareness. Um, Sabrina mentioned the course that I'm teaching at AU currently. It's part of the Women in Politics Institute, but the course is actually focused on self-awareness. It's focused on the roadblocks that we sometimes put in our own path. Sometimes it's a reaction to maybe something that happens to you externally, and the way in which you internalize that experience, sometimes you can erect a roadblock that can be very difficult for you to continue on. So that awareness, both as individuals as well as from an organizational standpoint, could that be a reason why you don't see more women rising to the top, whether it's in corporate America and the private sector in various capacities, or potentially you know, sticking your hat in to run for office like, like Ashley's done. And then looking around at your own network, your own social, social circle, and thinking about the women that are in those social, social circles and you know, why isn't she running for office? She'd be amazing. Have you ever said to her, you know what, you'd be amazing. You should really consider doing this. And just being more aware and more thoughtful about that. And so with that, I will end my filibuster and turn it over to Ashley. But I'm really delighted to be here and delighted to be part of a conversation that I think is incredibly important. Thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Ashley Carter, and I currently serve as the at-large representative for DC State Board of Education. And I'm the only Republican elected to citywide office in Washington, DC. And uh, and my story is actually very, uh, very interesting because I didn't go into politics wanting ever to actually be a politician. 
I did a lot of work behind the scenes. I have worked in congressmen's offices. Uh, I've worked uh, for the Maryland General Assembly. I was later a lawyer and worked uh, for, for Mitt Romney's campaign and a consultant on many different other campaigns around the country. Um, and I came to IWF because I was frankly, in a word, exhausted, and I wanted to uh, I f wanted to be home here in DC. I have a family here, I have a long-term relationship, and I thought that being in DC was very important. So uh, I am now working with IWF full-time as our coalition's director, but I also get a chance to speak around the country on our ish one of our main issues, being women in politics. And this time, uh, approximately two years ago, I was at a conference speaking to some young women about young women running for office. Because as a young woman myself, I had often felt um, that there weren't enough women on the either the campaign side, in the offices, or women in office today. So uh, it, I was on a panel very much like this, and we were discussing young women running for office, and I, I, we got to the Q&A portion, and a young woman about the age of 20, 22, pose the question to me, have you ever run for office? Mm -hmm. You're telling me to run for office, but have you? And at that time, I kind of laughed because me being a young Republican woman in Washington, DC, I never thought it would be possible. I, 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 first of all, I, and I didn't actually have a reason to run for office here in the, in the city. Uh, although I had been uh, in the city for over 10 years, I didn't f feel like it was my time. I said, no, no, I haven't run, but you still can. <laughs> <laughs> and I went home and I didn't think much of it. Uh, but later that week, we live, I currently live on an up and coming neighborhood in DC with a lot of young families. I'm very friendly with my neighbors and we all uh, get together very frequently for dinner. Uh, I was speaking to our next door neighbors who have a, uh, who had at the time a very young daughter, uh, she's now three years old, and they said, well, it's really a shame. We love where we live. We can walk to the grocery store, the restaurants, bars, the dry cleaner, and we're probably going to leave DC when our child gets to school age. And I had heard this many of times. And I thought to myself going home that night, well, why is that? And having a conversation, they said, you know, we can't afford the high cost of private schools here in DC, and our public schools are very low performing. In fact, they're the worst in the nation. So us, I actually live on our block is our elementary school. It is 100 feet away from our house. You cannot get closer to a school. Our neighbors were willing to move to Maryland or Virginia all because of the school system. And that got me angry because I myself am a homeowner here in DC. I love this city. I've lived here for 10 years and I want to raise my own children here. And that's when I looked into the, the stats, the figures of DC schools and I said, you know what, somebody needs to change the status quo. And even though I thought I was going to run, it wasn't until February of last year that I was actually at a Right Now event, and I was speaking to some friends of mine who happened to be in this room, and I had not told another single soul other than uh, my family uh, that I was planning on running. And when they cheered me on, and they said, you're going to do this, how can I help? That's when I said I, I knew I had to run. That's my story, and I won. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jen Higgins. <laughs> I don't know if my mic's on, but that's okay. I think it is on. Um, thanks for having me. Um, this is my hobby. Um, it's not my full-time job, so every time I get the opportunity to be on a panel, I always feel like the odd man out because uh, I don't do this for a living. There are plenty of folks in this audience and on this panel who really are the folks who 
make our candidates who run for office, who are the women in Congress, who are the women on the school board, who are our future Congresswomen, um, like Laura Cox Kaplan. Um, so I, I'm very fortunate to be able to have a conversation with you. And so I think my background is really, I'm a healthcare lobbyist, it's what I do every single day. But like many of you, I, I saw our party and I saw a problem, which is the fact that we don't have enough women in our party. We don't have enough women willing to take that leap. And so you have to sort of think about why that is. And I think a lot of people could spend hours analyzing why women aren't running, what they're missing. And I think I've talked to many women who go, well, why didn't it work out? Why didn't I make it through the primary? Why didn't anyone ask me to run? Why didn't I win? How did I not make it past the finish line? And I think we, we can talk about barriers, but um, one of the things that I've gotten involved in besides Running Star is uh, I co-chair an organization, or I chair an organization called Right Now Women Pack. Um, and I think one of the big problems that I, we saw in the party, and many thanks to folks like Julie Conway, who really were trailblazers in this space, is this idea that you need, women need resources. They need infrastructure, but they also need the resources to run. If I walked up to you right now and said you have to raise $5 million to have, be competitive in a primary to be the congresswoman from your district, you look at me and go, I I've never raised $5 million before. And you can sell all the Girl Scout cookies in the world, but you're probably not going to ever have raised $5 million in your entire life. So I think one of the things I've looked at is we've looked at a lot of the data, which is that if you look at the 2016 cycle, for example, we had 51 women who were Republican on the ballot in, across the country, Republican women on the ballot nationwide who were running for Congress, Senator, delegate from Puerto Rico, whatever you want to call it. And what happened? Uh, less than half of those women made it to Congress. They made it to the 115th Congress. And of those women, the vast majority of those women were Democrats. Um, Democrats have made great strides in getting uh, minority women elected, getting women of diverse backgrounds and ethnicities elected to Congress, and we're still struggling just to get Republican women elected to Congress. Let's not go too far afield and think that we're going to get people that are different looking with different backgrounds. Um, I've been incredibly frustrated with this, and so I wanted to make a change, which was really how do we find a way to a, figure out what the problem is and then figure out what the solution is. And I've always thought that money was part of that, but I think to Laura's comment about the sort of the running start aspect, we have to build a pipeline, which means we have to start asking women to run for office, and we have to keep telling them that they need to be able to have a chance of being successful. Um, I think a couple of women I've talked to who are candidates have been, frankly, frustrated with the current political environment. I think they've been, they were turned off by the election, and they go, you know, I'm really disappointed in my party, and I'm disappointed, and I wasn't really a big Trump supporter, and I'm not really sure if, like, there's a place for me in this party. Is there a place for my viewpoints? Do Republicans want women to run for office? Because it looks like we don't have that many of them, and we're not doing enough to help them get across the finish line. And I think that I'm not as pessimistic as others are about our ability to recruit good quality candidates, because simply put, I think the woman I talk to, I go, you can either be on the sidelines watching, or you can be a part of your party and you can be active in changing how people view it. And so a big part of that is having folks say, hey, why aren't you running? You keep telling me to run, you gotta run. And so you take that leap. And so we hopefully get to a place where that young woman who lives in rural Michigan decides she wants to run, who's Hispanic and is a Republican and hasn't really told a lot of her friends, but wants to find a way to be out there in the world and wants your support and help. And then we tell her, where do you go? And that's the next part of the problem is that we get them motivated, but then where do we send them? You know? And so we need to give them the tools. And so I can send them to Julie Conway, and she can give them all the greatest advice in the world, and she can raise them all the money in the world. But is that going to be enough to get that woman to win that primary, to win that general election? And we've left a lot of women on the battlefield. So a big part of my role with the PAC and my efforts to try to help Republican women have really been about um, not only diagnosing the problem, but figuring out what the solutions are. And some of that's money. Some of that is building that network of women like ourselves and others who can really say, I, I know this wonderful woman. Have you met her, Ashley Carter? You don't live in DC, but I'm sure you have 20 friends who live in DC that would be more than happy to help her knock on doors or make phone calls. And so we're all sort of using our own networks, but to build a network of women across the country who are Republicans who want to help other women, not just financially, but also professionally through a network is important. Um, right now, Women Pack has been around for about four years. We've raised close to $200,000 since our inception in late 2014 and given them to candidates like Nan and others simply because of the fact that we have women who are under 40 across the country who want to be involved in the political process and don't necessarily know where to go. And so we've raised almost all of that money from women who are giving under $50 who are in their 20s or 30s who say, I want to be involved. And so they come to me and say, I want to knock on doors or I want to go to New York and campaign for Nan or I want to 
um, find a way to on social media to tweet out the fact that Karen Handel is a great candidate in Georgia, and I have friends from college there who want to help her. And I think the goal here is to really to continue that momentum, and we do have a lot of work to do. Sabrina points out. I think I want to believe that this is like the perfect situation, the perfect storm, where Republican women kind of all recognize that we have a gap and we need to close that gap. So they all kind of come to the table in 2018 and say, you know what, I'm ready to run. Like, what do I, just, well, sign me up, tell Julie Conway that I need to get moving, like ASAP. And I think that's the part that I'm excited about, which is why I'm part of an organization like Right Now Women Pack and I'm part of Running Start and I'm happy to be here because a big part of that is making sure that we're all sort of working towards the same goal, which is um, reinforcing the effort that we need more women in our party because to Laura's point, she's absolutely right that women at the table make a huge difference. And in terms of political parity, we need that in this country. And so we can't have 100 women in Congress and 75 of them be Democrats. We need a little bit more than that. Out of 535 people, I think we can do better than that. So I sort of call on all of you to um, help out, do your part, but I um, look forward to taking your questions. Well, I, I start out, and I hope you don't, I, I was typing just a little bit notes because I realized I didn't bring a pen and paper. Um, but I, looking at this room and being on this panel and having the friendships that I've been privileged to have as a Republican woman in, uh, in Congress and as a candidate, including the indomitable Julie Conway. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Laura. No, I mean, marvelous friends and such strength women who inspire, women who compel, uh, women about whom one would say, my God, you know, with, with this, the strength that's in this room, why do we not have 100 Republican women in Congress, right? I mean, that, that's really what you'd ask. I was privileged in the district uh, in New York, uh, the Hudson Valley of New York, an hour to two hours north of New York City. I had a Republican uh, woman predecessor in our congressional seat, and certainly Sue Kelly, who served for six terms and had uh, uh, obviously a great deal of prominence, and she was a, a kind mentor and friend to me. Um, I ran naively. Um, nobody, actually nobody did recruit me. My husband, God bless him, <laughs> was a good man, and every Republican woman needs a good man behind her, but uh, you know, my husband suggested to me that I might want to run in the 2010 cycle, um, and I did. Uh, and along the way, obviously, I was able to uh, have many friends and mentors. Um, but what I uh, what I learned, uh, I don't mean to say, but what I learned, and what I learned, what I observed, uh, is that. Um, in order to succeed, and I'm building on uh, the comments that, is particularly that uh, Laura and Jen made, you know, there is, to succeed in politics, especially at any level, really, but, you know, congressional level becomes high stakes politics, as we know, Senate even more so. Any, any you know, federal office there tends to garner national attention in some way and, and national involvement, whether it's uh, obvious or not. Uh, but I think there's basically, there's a, there's a combination of time that one has spent in political life, wherever it is, you, whatever precinct or district uh, or state in which you may want to run. Uh, there are relationships, obviously those are a function of time to some extent, having a network, you know, if you start from nothing, you have no political network, uh, and also resources. You know, generally that means money. Uh, so I was able to run as a naive uh, candidate because I did happen to have a, a certain amount of personal resources that I could put into a campaign and resources will make up for some of the lack of time that you spent and some of the relationships that you haven't made because as uh, Laura and Jen pointed out, when you have resources, when you have a leadership pack, for example, you can help others. That builds relationships. A lot of chairmanships in Congress come about because uh, these members have been particularly astute at distributing uh, their uh, their help, and and that's and that's fine. It's all you know part of what we do to help strengthen each other. Um, so, but you need that, you need time, relationships, resources in some combination. Most people do not have the resources to run for Congress. 
So I think part of our challenge in the Republican Party, and as you pointed out, Jen, on the Democratic side, we do, we have, we have a lot of, uh, I don't know what the ratio of women to men is in the House Democratic Caucus. Julie probably does know, right? You, you 105 know. Are women okay. total, 76, I think. 76 and 20. Yeah, it's under 20% yeah, total. Yeah. Less than 20% of the Democratic conference, Correct. of the Democratic caucus. Interesting. Okay, because when I was in the House, the House Republican it's conference, right, it was, it, we were 10% of the House Republican conference, which was you know, sm a smaller proportion, obviously, than the Democratic side. And I think, as a matter of evolution, I think that is going to change. Uh, because I think um, women are reaching in, in corporate boards, uh, you know, positions of prominence in the educational system. We talked about it earlier. You know, women, I'm mother of two sons. Women are dominating uh, in education now for reasons that don't belong in this discussion. But, um, but I think you're, we're going to see just a gradual evolution of more and more women on both sides of the aisle. Uh, taking greater roles, but it is uh, conspicuous on the Republican side, and I think it, that's because in the, now, now I come from the Northeast, so we all uh, probably have some familiarity with how politics uh, has certain regional qualities. So in the Northeast, uh, look at New York City. Uh, you know, most women of means in New York City f support the Democratic Party. It's just, the fact of life, um, and I think you know much of it probably does have to do with uh, certain aspects of what are perceived as social issues. Um, at least that certainly was the content of discussions that I had over and over again in my time as a candidate and as a member of Congress. Um, so I think Democratic women start out with a big money advantage. Uh, if you look at you know Emily's list, I don't know what the ratio is between Emily's list and Maggie's list, which is a, you know a lovely bunch of Republican women, but I think Maggie's list struggles yeah. relative to an organization like I think right now it's doing very well. Uh, but you know they just I mean they just you know, they Hoover in checks from uh, women who feel the Democrats represent the party of empowerment. So I think you know one of our challenges is, and I think that's IWF is so well positioned to be the champions for changing the perception among members of the public uh, who uh, participate in discourse, who, who vote, who uh, get involved at the ground level, or who fund campaigns, that what the uh, conservative side of policy does, uh, and you know, for most of us that does translate into Republican in some form, um, but you know we can truly uh, be better. We have better ideas for women uh, than our uh, counterparts, <laughs> whom we also respect. But but you know that that we should be at the table. Um, and I think it is it is a, a phenomenon that uh, has significant uh, logistical uh, components and cultural. Uh, components, and that's why it's so important to uh, be mentor uh, and and have networks like the ones that that you've started up, and and we're very grateful for it, and I am grateful for it, and that friends like Julie and others in this room have participated in, uh, because we have we we Republican women. Um, are more at risk than our Democratic counterparts. We just, uh, Republican politics has tended to be more the province of, of men. And I think they're also, I'll add one more thing, then I'll shut up, but I think, and I'd love to hear the audience's thoughts on this, but um, I have floated this idea with some friends. I floated with Ashley when we spoke a couple weeks ago. Republican women in general, again, I'm speaking broadly, but tend to have a more traditional mindset about certain things, um, and I think they, you know, they, especially in terms of um, the way in which they manage their personal relationships, their families. I think, you know, the the, the whole um, 
uh, way in which we live our lives, especially when we have children, and frankly, the way in which we're still socialized in this country. You know, we, women tend to be the ones who manage hearth and home. You know, and I was one of those women, and I'm sure probably every woman in this room is one of those women who, you know, when they said, well, guess what? You can do everything the men can do. Oh, by the way, the men aren't going to do anything more than they used to do. <laughs> right? Yes. Yeah, so it's like, you are going to have a job, absolutely. And by the way, when you get home, you still have to take care of the kids. And it's like, <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> you know, can, I, can I sleep a couple hours at some point? But anyway, but I, think, but I do think that that does play into uh, Republican women's participation in politics, you know, because, because, you know, for those of us who feel very strongly uh, the, the, the responsibility, the obligations, sweet and precious and wonderful as they are, uh, to manage the home front, I think that that does, you know, politics is all, I was able to do what I did because I could devote 24-7 to running in a campaign for Congress uh, in which I had to compete, you know, not only in a primary, but also in a general. Uh, and it really is, it's an incredibly uh, life-consuming thing. And for people who value that time with, uh, you know, with alternative ways of uh, spending their time, uh, it can be really tough. So I just, I'm throwing that out there because I'd, I'd be curious to, you know, whether or not, uh, you know, what you all think about that as a sociological aspect. But I think that does play probably more on the conservative side than on the left. Well, thank you for those initial thoughts, and it's interesting. <laughs> my, my dad ran for Congress in 1996, and I was when I went to college, and I used to say that they replaced me with a campaign. It was sort of like, it was such a full-time job. I went yeah, off and empty nest, and then they ran for office. Yeah. Um, I think I need to play a little bit of devil's advocate for a minute before we get into advancing women. I, Laura knows I, I started maybe like a big skeptic, and now I've come really very close, so. <laughs> but, you know, a number of years ago, Leslie Sanchez, GOP pollster, wrote a book called We've Come, You've Come a Long Way, Maybe. And the premise of the book was that we don't have enough women in public office. And I had this conversation with her. I reviewed the book, and I talked to her about it, and I said, you know, does it really matter, right? You know, we have women who are, you know, we have the Dana Perinas of the world, right? And we have women who are running campaigns. We have the Kellyanne Conways of the world. You know, does it really matter that we don't have that many women in office? Maybe it's just responding to women's preferences and strengths and aptitudes. And her response is that, look, you know, we ha yes, we have a lot of female influencers. We don't have enough decision makers. So I would love you, maybe, Jen, you want to start with this as your sort of, how important is it? And are we sort of overlooking where women's strengths are? And you know, why do we really need more women as opposed to men with the same political values that someone shares? Sure, I think if you, it comes back to what you ascribe to, which I, like you said, you evolved in your viewpoint yes. just like I <laughs> yeah, did, which is I, we were on a show a couple weeks ago and one of the questions about education, and it's like, do you have to have more African American teachers to teach more African American right. students because do people relate more? So is a, is a woman representing me the only way that my views get represented in Congress, or can a man just as effectively represent the views of the women in his district? Mm -hmm. I'm sure you represented the views of the men in your district. You weren't just like, I'm gonna support the women and their agenda, that's why I was elected. So I do think that it depends on your viewpoint on whether women can only represent women. I think one of the good examples that we've seen sort of recently has been this conversation, at least I'm in the healthcare world, so I, I did three different interactions on Monday of this week where people said to me, I can't believe that working group for the Republicans doesn't have any women in it. Like, so the Senate is going to be working on healthcare policy and there's 13 white men in a room deciding the fate of the American healthcare system. And I wanted to say, well, d does it matter? Because I think those women are gonna be equally as vocal in the conversation, the process. But let's say Lisa Murkowski was on that panel. They go, well, of course they put a woman on it because she's the token woman in the conversation. <laughs> and I hate to say that, but that was my immediate response, that, right? is that just by putting a woman on the panel, so we have five Republican women in the US Senate. So it's not like we have a ton of women that we're picking from here. But I guess my thing, it's about your perspective. I still believe that men can effectively represent women's dialogue just as much as women can effectively represent men. But I do think when it comes to some of these more complicated social issues, frankly, I do think there's an important role that women play in the conversation nationally. And you're right, elevating them to a decision-making level is critical, but we're, we're just trying to get people in the door at this point. Right. So let's talk about that before we start talking about who's gonna be chairman of a committee and who's gonna be the next woman Republican Speaker of the House. So I'm gonna like downplay the expectations a little it's, bit. It's really, hard to, it's really hard to conflate what we see in the private sector with the impact on 
women in public office. What, what impact do women have that's different than when you're represented by men? But you know in the corporate setting that there's a clear correlation that companies perform better. You see study after study after study, all these statistics. It's just not a far stretch to say that having more women also in elected office, you would produce very similar results. And so I think the problem with not having women at the table is that you're not getting that viewpoint. It's not to say that men can't represent women and that men, women can't represent men, but the value at having that different point of view. I mean, think about a scenario in which you're sitting around a table with you're the only woman and you're there with a table full of men, right? What's your comfort level in raising a tough issue that you know other women would put on the table? Like there's, there's a different impact that a woman brings to the table in a conversation. Your set of experiences for the most part are probably pretty different from the men in the room. That's the piece. It's not to say that you can't do it. It's that it's so much better when you have women at the table because they're gonna raise issues in, in, a, in a way that will represent us more effectively. And I do think that that's super important in a representative democracy. It's never gonna be perfect, but it can be a heck of a lot better than what it is. And I think, I personally think that's the reason. And because you've got all of these statistics and studies and all of these other sectors and areas, I think that's giving us data that you can also use in this context. It's hard to show the direct parallel, right? Because you're, you know, okay, well, how many bills did she sponsor? How many things? I mean, those are not great measures right. as man and others in general attest on the panel. Those are not great factors to evaluate success or failure or impact, but you see it in the other sectors. And so that's, to me, what really made the case from my standpoint, because I sort of arrived at this conclusion coming from a very similar vantage point with you all. I'd never really highlighted or thought about my role as a woman within the corporate sector. And I, I, was, I came out of the accounting world, which was very, very male dominated. While the professional services firms do a great job of uh, promoting women and they've got some of the best policies that exist out there for women, at the same time, it was and is still pretty male dominated. And so I never sort of thought about or highlighted or felt like I was special because I was a woman. That came about later when other women, when I started to have children, and other women would say to me, we want you to stand up and tell your story. We want you to talk about what it's like to be a working mom. Like, what do you mean? It's just, you know, it's just like you. But I was not appreciating the value of, of using the platform that I had to role model this, to show them here's what it looks like, that for some people they needed to hear it. It wasn't true for everybody, but for some people that was important. Let me ask a quick follow-on question, because Laura, you've been teaching this class at, at AU with Jennifer Lawless, who's a professor there, and um, you know she did some really interesting research last year, or year before, um, that sort of suggested that this issue of gender bias in politics may be overstated. And I thought it was fascinating, because they, they examined um, uh, 350 congressional campaigns, the print media um, coverage of that, as well as this CCES data. Anyway, <laughs> I don't want to bore people with the survey data. But what they found was that there was no, literally no indication of gender bias. And, and I don't think that Jennifer is coming from a particularly, you know, sort of conservative perspective Not here, right? <laughs> so it was sort of fascinating. It really definitely was a little bit jarring in the literature because there's been this sort of consistent drumbeat that there is this gender bias. So I did want to ask you, um, and, and I would love, especially Nan, maybe you'll want to chime in here. How big a problem is gender bias? You know, is that something that is really holding women back? Is it really awful in the trenches, so to speak? Um, well. I was very fortunate. I did not, I didn't perceive any bias against me because I was a woman. If anything, it was a political advantage actually to uh, be a woman, at least on the Republican side. Um, you know, doctor, mother, businesswoman, that was my little tagline. And people loved it. Now, I do think, and I found this, frankly, as a physician as well, and I'd love to hear uh, if you find it in, in business. But uh, th there, there are cultural, I mean, having said, I did not feel a bias against me, but are there different cultural expectations that people have from a woman versus a man? I think there are, actually, yeah. As a doctor, you perceive it. You know, people uh, come to, and it was fine. I was happy to, 
uh, conform to those because I do tend to be nurturing and compassionate and I'll listen and you know hold your hand and, and I'm not saying that glibly I mean people but people do come in uh, to a woman I think or approach a woman expecting something uh, maybe resembling you know maternal uh, values and I, I think it can be a virtue uh, and I think you know on the Republican side it's not that people are biased against uh, women candidates really not at all but again just what we were talking about you know uh, women haven't been participating as much in the political process in general on the Republican side to develop those you know long-term networks as the guys have who've been you know hanging out at the VFW and in the you know in the uh, you know the smoke-filled rooms or now you know <laughs> french fry filled rooms or whatever uh, you know watching games and stuff and politicking so we're, we're changing that yeah I, I might get in trouble for saying this but you know, I, I do like think that there. <laughs> I, I do think that there's something to be said for how we respond to perceived bias or instances in which somebody's made you feel different because you're a woman, as opposed to sort of using it to your advantage. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, look, I don't feel like I've ever suffered discrimination. Maybe I am unique and unusual in that regard, and and certainly consider myself very lucky. Um, but I, I also was, I mean, was always in very male-dominated fields, whether it was working on Capitol Hill, I always worked for men, my mentors were all men, I really had not worked with women until I, I got into the private sector. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think there's at least a part of this that relates to how we respond to perceived discrimination mm -hmm. and what we do when we encounter it and sort of do we internalize it or do we find ways of using it to either to our advantage or just letting it go? You know, finding a way to turn it around and not, not sort of taking it to heart, if that makes sense. And I would never in a million years belittle anybody who had suffered discrimination at all. Mm -hmm. I would just say, like, making sure that we're being really self-aware about how we respond to those impulses, I think that's a piece that's super important. And this is part of what we talk about in the course, even though the course is focused on your self-awareness and the kinds of things that you may do to yourself about your self-doubt and do you hold yourself up to a standard of perfectionism that is impossible to achieve, right? Doing your best is one thing. Striving for perfection, you're never gonna make it and therefore it can prevent you from taking a risk in the first place. Like that kind of stuff is what we think about and talk about. But you know, there are plenty of conversations that I'm a, a part of all the time with women talking about how candidates are, are discriminated against in some way that they have, you know, women candidates have to justify who's gonna take care of their children when they run for office, whereas their male counterpart who will also have children will never get that question. This is also true abroad, by the way. I've done you know, several exchange trips with mm -hmm. elected women and you hear the same kind of conversation. So there are some differences um, I don't know that I'm answering the question, no, 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 but no, no, I think no, it's really, really yeah, complicated. I'll add to that really quickly, sorry. I, I think that one of the things that concerns me about our party is that I, when we talk about gender bias and candidates is that I think there are a lot of women who are still turned off about running because our party looks mostly like this. No offense to these women on the panel, but if you're a white woman or a white man and you're running for office, that's great, but let's say you're a gay Hispanic Republican woman. Like, I, I think that's the thing is that I've heard of candidates going to meet with the party and literally going, you don't look the way that we want our candidates right. to look. And so we still have very much a cookie cutter mold in our party. And the only way you break through that is that if you have more Mia Loves and Martha McSally's, and I hate to say mm -hmm. that, but it's true because I think the only way that people recognize that our party is inclusive and that it's a party that we believe in is as a party that it brings all people into the tent. It doesn't just bring certain types of people who have who can fund their own campaign or who can have the right network because of their background or their personal experiences. And I think that's still the part for me as a Republican, and I, it sounds weird to say this, but I continue to be a Republican simply because, not simply, but in large part because of the fact that I represent something that's not your traditional Republican. And if mm -hmm. I don't come and speak at things like this, then people think that Republicans are only old white men. And I don't want that for our party because I still very much believe in the values of the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. But it also frustrates me that 
we can have women that can come to the NRCC or the NRSC and say they want to run and they can get taken off a list because they dressed a certain way because they were a 30 something millennial who wore uh, like stilettos that were five inches instead of two inch flats. And I think that's really, and I hate to say that, but there are stories of that. And I really want to believe that when we're looking at candidates, that we're looking at all types of women who are Republicans and who ascribe to the values of the Republican Party. And it's interesting. And I'll just add one thing. You actually answered the question I was about to ask you, which is what role, especially on the Republican side, does the party have? And the reason I was going to ask you that question is that there was, yet again, another, there was a field experiment out of Brigham Young University where they, in effect, <clears throat> encouraged, um, in, in one of the treatment groups, party leaders to reach out and, and to sort of stoke interest in some of the female candidates. And it was wildly successful. Um, and so it seems as though that's something that we, we very much see on the Democratic side, perhaps not as much as they like to say it is, but that it's something that's truly lacking on the Republican side. And so um, that was my, my question for your, your answer. But would you like to add to that, just, Ashley, about yeah, the Yeah, just a point to add, because uh, recent statistics have shown that when women run, they win. And they win in equal amounts, uh, just as equally as men do. And I agree uh, wholeheartedly with Jen's recent comment because if anything, in my recent campaign and the campaigns that I've worked on, I've never experienced uh, direct gender bias from, if, if it was gender bias, it was in fact from other women that I was experiencing this from. Because, especially in DC, I was a young, attractive 30-something woman who was a Republican and lived in Southeast, um, in Southeast DC. And I was told from Upper Northwest uh, uh, white women who were much older than me that I couldn't win. Um, wh and we see this um, looking at other women candidates, female candidates, I think it's not that we, they don't want to win uh, or don't want to run. It's that we have a lack of female candidates running for several factors. A, the flexibility in the schedule. Uh, if not for IWF, who has a culture of flexibility, I never would have been able to run. I was running pr uh, before work, after work, taking time off to work. And we sit here and talk about mothers who, you know, if you're a mother, you're running your ship, you're running your household, you're running your family. That's, that's a big deal. And if you don't already have money, again, I had already worked, uh, we need to have women who are uh, knowledgeable about campaigns and about the election process. Uh, had I not already worked in uh, campaigns and had been through many, many different training programs, Running Starts Next Step program, I had uh, support from, from Right Now PAC, I had support from View PAC, I had been to Women's Campaign School at Yale, uh, I had already been through these training programs. Had I not, I would have been starting from scratch. And I think that's one of the big roles that the party needs to play is not only identifying candidates, but helping to build a pipeline of candidates so when these women want to run, they are actually ready, they are trained, they know how to work uh, uh, communications, they know how to fundraise, they know how to deal with the press, they know how to sit here and uh, form a stump speech. It, it goes well along, much more than along those lines. It comes down to, unfortunately, being a woman, we also have to worry these days about how we dress, what we say, what, uh, whether our nail polish is the right color, or whether our heels, uh, whether they have marks on them. And unfortunately, that is a truth in our, in our lives. Um, but it's something that we'll have to deal with, and it's something that the party need, needs to teach female candidates. Well, my heels definitely have marks on it because I, I always say that the last vestiges of sexism are here in DC with our cobblestone and like brick oh, everywhere. Like every pair of yeah, my shoes yeah, are destroyed. Destroy Those men. <laughs> we might, let me ask one last question and then we can open it up to the audience. But since we're on the topic of other studies and things, um, one of the things that strikes me is that the real culprit for why women don't run is this factor that some academics out of Pittsburgh said which is the noisiness of the modern campaign, that there's so much talk about mm. what she's wearing or you know, what she wrote in college or what he did before, you know, all the stuff that really doesn't matter 
and that prevents us from having a conversation about health care or tax policy or whatever it may be. And then women are turned off by that noise. And I have to admit, I mean, that sounds horrifying, right? It just, I, I often wonder, what would they talk about? Like, what would, what would be the big thing that they would want to talk about other than tax reform or any of the issues, paid leave, whatever? So um, let me offer that to the panel, and then we can open it up for other. Very quickly, I can start out. Uh, it's interesting because having just been a candidate in this past election uh, and being a Republican, I there was a lot of noise where, and uh, someone once um, referred to this as you you want to sit here and talk about the issues, but. All, and I'm sitting here, I want to talk about education, education, education as a policy issue, but all anyone else wants to talk about is Trump. And that's all, I, all the questions I got about was Trump. Or I had spoken at the RNC, and uh, my uh, candidate, the campaign, or the candidate that I was uh, against, that's all she wanted to bring up was RNC and Trump and Trump and Trump. Whereas I'm sitting here talking about the issues and they're holding it against me that I'm a Republican. Um, but there is a lot of noise. Uh, things get brought up in campaigns that should never be brought up um, about. And you really need to hone in and as a candidate and make sure you're talking about ideas. The ideas that you want to instill upon your community, upon your state, or upon your country. Um, and how you effectively are going to change, change the face of what's going on in America. Because if you're not going to do it, who is? You're going to need to make sure that you are different than your opponent. And you're going to need to identify and show that you can do this differently than, than Tiddly wink, you know, comments. <laughs> Did you notice a difference like the first time you ran versus the uh, second time you ran? Like in terms of the dialogue and like how easier or harder it was to break uh, through? That's a, a great question. Every, every, actually, every, I ran three times. Every yeah. campaign was different. Sure. And of course, the, between my first and second campaigns, we had redistricting. So our district was net Democratic when I ran, and even more so when I ran as the incumbent in 2012. And that did play a role. Uh, in the uh, in the results, um, I, I I admire you so much, Ashley, for doing what you did um, in D.C., which is so overwhelmingly Democratic, and you know you pack and right now pack and running start all contributed strength to you. It is so important to have and Jen, apropos of your question. To succeed in challenging places, I can only, I, I can speak most intimately to running in a swing district, right? You know, that's what I did. To succeed in a place like that, and the, it, it tends to be difficult for our national Republicans, like the NRCC, you know, and they have virtues and strengths and great hearts, but it can be very difficult for them to come in and materially make a difference. I mean, unless they're pouring resources, and I see Julie nodding, unless they know intimately what the, and, and you know, what that, you, you, the, the analogy I use is this, the expression I use is this, you can see the roadmap, but you won't know where the potholes are unless you intimately know a district. So it goes back to the fact that we do, and it's it just what we're talking about here. Unless